So thus far we've spent time reviewing some of the privileges that we can define to allow access from both local and remote hosts. What we'd like to now spend time doing is discussing the privileges scopes that are available within the MySQL environment. Privilege scopes allow us to essentially grant privileges or access to various users either local or remote to various levels within the database from global all the way down to the routines that can be run such as create, alt, grant and so on. Let's open a shell and continue taking notes. So we're going to spend this entire section just discussing the various privilege scopes that we can work with. Once we understand the hierarchy we can then feel free to explore assigning privileges to the various scopes to different users both local and remote. Let's launch gedit. In fact, if we simply exclamation gedit, it should launch the most recent copy of gedit, which backgrounds and brings to the fore the text document that we're working on. So we want to discuss in this section MySQL's privileges scopes. And privileges scopes, once again, allow us to assign privileges to local and remote users to various levels within the database. If you think about a database, it's a hierarchical layout or representation of various objects, generally beginning with the DBMS server at the top of the hierarchy, followed by one or more DBs or databases, followed by one or more, usually more than one, tables, followed by even deeper in the hierarchy, one or more columns and this is the general hierarchy structure of a database system. It's very simple to understand. The DBMS is responsible for managing one or more DBs which contains one or more tables which ultimately contains one or more columns. And even below the column level we can restrict access as mentioned to various routines such as create, alter, etc. Let's say for example there's a column that's defined called cost and cost ha is defined as perhaps a character column which can store let's say two characters well a type of routine that you may want to grant a user privileges to use would be for example in the case where the user needs to alter the column or the definition of the column they'd need the alter routine privilege so even beneath the column level we can assign different privileges at the routine level. So we'll also specify yet another level called the, and we'll put it on par with columns because it applies not only to columns but to tables as well and to, as well to DBs. Routine level. So this is the basic hierarchy of most DBMS systems on the market today. DBMS, databases, one or more, tables, columns, and routines. Routines can also include stored procedures, views, and the like. MySQL certainly allows us to set up this sort of privilege structure, but in order to understand how it works, we should spend some time inside of MySQL's terminal monitor examining the grant tables that we've discussed and worked with thus far. So from a shell, we're going to connect to the MySQL instance, providing it's running. Let's just SUN and authenticate, followed by and RC MySQL status to see whether it's running and the status isn't an option for RS, RC MySQL so we'll net stat NTL grep 3306 to see if it's bound to the network and it is. So MySQL is up and running but this isn't an ultimate check since you could start MySQL without networking support. It's just a quick check since we've yet to disable networking support. This tells us that we can connect to the local instance using the password prompt and as the user root and once we've authenticated to the DBMS which we'll do we'll execute a select user and you'll see that we're in as root we'll then execute a show databases to see the databases that are on the system this will also show you that we haven't added any new databases and we've yet to drop the default test database we'll want to focus on the MySQL database because it maintains the hierarchy which allows us to assign or revoke or grant or revoke privileges at various scopes. So the MySQL database not only maintains users who are allowed to access the system but also hosts 
as well as different privileges on different levels. So we'll execute a use MySQL to go into the context of the MySQL database, at which point we can execute a show tables, which reveals the various tables of which some are considered to be grant tables. We mentioned the DB table, the host table, as well as the user table is, are considered to be the three key grant tables. We mentioned earlier in our notes that the three key grant tables are those. But there are other tables that matter when it comes to providing privileged access into the database. In addition to DB, host, and user, notice that there's also prox underscore priv, tables underscore priv, as well as columns underscore priv. These three privilege tables control access to the various scopes that we can assign privileges within MySQL and we should describe those scopes very quickly. When we want to control access on a global level, so let's start with the global scope level, we will interact with the MySQL.user table, MySQL being the database, user being the table. So if you want to assign, for example, to a given user such as root, full access to all tables within the DBMS system, we'd simply assign those privileges at the user table level. Let's take a brief look at the user table. We'll select, or describe in this case, since we want to see the different columns that are defined within the user table. So let's describe user, and you'll see that there are many columns defined within the user table, including host, the familiar host, user, password. But notice that there are other privilege columns, which are the columns that store global privileges that the user is allowed to have while logged into MySQL, including select privileges. If this is turned on, and notice that the type of field is basically a Boolean, which accepts N or Y for no or yes. If select is granted, then the user can, at a global level, select or retrieve data from any of the tables in any of the databases throughout the DBMS system. So this is at a top level, and essentially granting select priv on, within the user table grants at a global level within your DBMS access to all tables managed by this instance of MySQL. Insert is pretty self-explanatory and so are update and delete privileges. These are the four key SQL commands that you're likely to run when working with DBMSs. Select, insert, update, and delete. We can assign these privileges globally and you'll see later on when we use PHP MyAdmin for example that we do have the ability to assign on a global basis or on a per database basis these various privileges. So again, assigning privileges is based entirely upon your structure, your organizational structure, and based on that structure you can assign privileges globally or on a lower scope. In some cases you may want to grant an application, such as a PHP application, access only to a given database. Well, there's a scope right beneath the global scope and that's considered to be the database scope level which allows us to grant access on a DB basis. The tables that we interact with to grant database scope level privileges include mysql.host as well as mysql.db. These two tables control database scope level access. Again, you'll see examples later on when we want to grant permissions directly to a given database rather than to the entire DBMS. So let's return to the user table, back to the global scope for a moment. There are additional privileges such as whether or not the user can create objects within the database including additional databases and tables within those databases and columns within those tables. So typical DBMS objects include databases themselves which are global containers, tables, and columns. If a user has the create privilege, the user, and this is on a global scale by the way, the user can create database objects, typical database objects including databases, tables, and columns. Drop privileges. In some environments you may want to assign solely the drop privilege to a given user. It's a dangerous privilege, by the way, because it allows the user to entirely remove the database from the system. It doesn't exactly delete the file from the file system, but 
it allows a user with the privilege the right to remove from the DBMS at any time access to that DBMS even if users are connected to the DBMS although any transactional processes will either complete or be rolled back reload privilege this is an important privilege if you want to reload the server you can if of course this particular privilege is assigned and we'll show you how this is used soon enough shutdown privilege via MySQL admin we can shut down the MySQL instance that's currently running so for example you may want to designate to various users within your operational environment the ability to shut down the server if for example the server is low on disk space or some sort of condition requires a shutdown one classic example is the ability to back the server up while it's offline you may want to assign to an operational class user the ability to shut the server and instruct them perhaps to use MySQL admin or some other means for bringing the server back up all without granting them excessive privileges such as delete, create, or drop, or even reload. There are process privileges. These apply to the different routines that we can grant a user access to, such as create, alter, grant, etc., which we'll be looking at. File privileges, the ability to load files in and out of MySQL into tables. And additional privileges. Alter, for example, we mentioned we, have, we may have a column that needs to be extended or multiple columns that need to be extended, which we can assign using the global or database scope level alter privilege. Now, there are more privileges, of course, that we'll be discussing, but you get the picture. On a global scale, you can define privileges so that the user who has these privileges defined can do so to any database which includes any of the objects beneath the database such as tables and columns as mentioned if you want to lock a user into a database scope which is the other scope which is one level beneath the entire DBMS then you'd interact with mysql.host and mysql.db tables so let's describe DB and here's DB's description which includes also host DB and user but additional pertinent privileges such as select, insert, update, and delete, you'll pretty much always find the four common SQL commands, which isn't by any means specific to MySQL, just specific to the SQL standard in general. Select, insert, update, delete, as well as create. So what this create privilege within the context of a DB allows the user who has the privilege the right to create additional objects beneath the DB and those objects would include tables which would then include sub-objects such as columns so there's a create privilege the drop privilege MySQL permits dropping of tables not only will it allow you to drop DBs but also tables in certain instances you may want to drop tables let's say for example there's a routine or a process which creates a temporary table for the sake of mirroring data or setting up temporary data structures you may want to grant a given user the ability to drop the table and this user could be tied to a process it may not be an actual human but it could actually be tied to a process that performs the creation of the temporary table and then the subsequent drop after it's finished using it so you don't store redundant data and use unnecessary disk space there's another privilege the grant privilege now when we were at the DBMS scope level which is controlled via the user table under MySQL we also notice the grant privilege. If a user in global scope mode has the grant privilege, the user can grant privileges to other databases in the system to other users. However, on a DBMS level, the user can only grant privileges within the DB. So within a DB level, not DBMS, the, the user is restricted to a given DB. So you may set up a database just for one application and grant the grant privilege to a given user who can then grant additional privileges to other users, but only within the context of the DB, of course. And here are other common privileges such as alter, the ability to index, locking, alter routine, create routines. Routines, by the way, are stored procedures, just MySQL's way of defining stored procedures. Super. So this is one of the two tables that's used for defining privileges on a database level. How about the host table? Let's describe host 
and we'll terminate this line with a semicolon. Remember, MySQL will prompt you unless it's one of those few commands that don't require the semicolon at the end. Now notice this table contains similar columns. You'll find that most of the grants tables or privileges tables contain host, DB, select, insert, update, and delete, the four most commonly used SQL statements, as well as create, drop, Create allows one to create additional objects, like objects, or sub-objects, or subordinate objects, such as columns within tables or tables within DBs. And if you just look at this hierarchy, you'll get a sense for what are subordinate objects. If you're at the DB level, a table is a subordinate. If you're at a table level, a column is a subordinate. And if you're at a table level, a routine may be a subordinate which acts upon a table, such as a trigger which is certainly supported in the 5.x series of MySQL. So, this is the host table, and it too allows us to restrict access on a per DB basis. But again, you know that MySQL, or at least you should know by now that MySQL, bases its decision upon whether or not to grant access to the DB MS as well as to various DBs based on usernames and host names. Now next we're going to drill down to the table and column levels and then we're going to practice using the grant as well as revoke commands and see the effects of using those two commands on local and remote users. So let's continue our discussion about privileges that can be assigned within a MySQL environment. Hopefully by now if you have any other DBMS experience you realize that MySQL is designed pretty straightforwardly and it works pretty logically as a result. So it's a nice clean hierarchical design and it is not foreign, it's just simply logical. Very easy to understand. No fluff, no extra anything to comprehend. So it's pretty clean and we hope you appreciate its simplicity. Yet it is re a remarkably powerful DBMS which can scale to many many terabytes to suit almost any of the needs that you will likely encounter within your corporate environment. So, just to recap briefly, some of the privileges that we've discussed. We know that a DBMS is basically a hierarchy of objects. It's a structured way of presenting data, retaining, storing, and presenting data. The hierarchy or the top of the hierarchy begins or be belongs to the DBMS, is owned by the DBMS, and the DBMS is responsible for subordinate objects. Subordinate objects include DBs. DBs are right beneath the DBMS or managed directly by the DBMS. Databases themselves contain tables, and tables contain columns. Tables also contain routines, and sometimes columns can contain routines. Let's just look at this from the outside coming in once more. We connect to MySQL as the user root who has full access. We execute a show databases and we're currently seeing right beneath the top of the hierarchy which represents the DBMS management system the DBs that are under management including MySQL and test. So here we have examples of MySQL and test. Then within MySQL, after we've executed a use MySQL, and notice we didn't need to specify the semicolon after use MySQL, we will execute a show tables which is somewhere in our history, we don't need to retype it in, and we are now one level down to the subordinate object level or table level. Tables include user, and let's just show you that subordinate objects of databases include tables which include in this case for MySQL user DB host let's just place those three tables host DB as examples and beneath tables logically tables contain columns so if we describe a table such as host you'll see that host contains various columns such as select, insert, update, and delete privileges. We'll go with the select, insert, update, delete because they're so common. So let's remove the cost car2 that we have defined here and go with select priv, insert priv, update priv, and delete priv. These are individual columns which happen to be booleans or 
enumerated values of yes or no, so you can treat them like booleans, false or trues, of whether or not a user, or in this case a host, since we described the host table is granted the given permission to a given DB. Great. And routine levels are even a lower level in that routines can be assigned on a high level, such as the ability for a user to create a database on a lower level. So routine level really applies to all levels because at a high level, a routine would allow one to create a new database using the create command. A routine would also allow or permit the user to create within a database a new table. So we'd end up with a new table, let's call it new TBL. This would be a function or directly related to one's ability to execute a routine. In this create case, the routine would be to create a new table. And a routine would also allow you to create columns within tables and to assign triggers and store procedures which are referred to also as routines. So routines apply to all levels, but there are also privileges that can be assigned. Now, as we've mentioned, there are other levels that we need to consider, tables, columns, and routines. We've looked at the tables that pertain to global as well as the database levels. The global level is controlled by the mysql.user table. So on a global basis, we interact with the mysql.user table. When dealing with permissions at a database scope level, such as wanting to lock a user or a set of users into a specific database, we deal with two databases, mysql.host as well as mysql.db. If you use a front-end tool such as phpMyAdmin, a lot of this information is obscured and as a result you don't even see it and don't understand what's happening. But when you understand what's happening from this perspective, it makes it easier to understand how graphical tools behave or what's meant when you see some of the aliases on the fields and options and checkboxes and so on. So again, at this level, we deal with these two tables. And then at a lower level, such as with tables and columns, we'll begin with tables because logically, after databases, the next subordinate object type would be a table. You can't have columns without tables. Even if you have one column, it's defined within a table. So the next level is a table scope level, and we control privileges or control access to tables, in other words, privileges, using the table privilege. And we'll show you that table momentarily. So at the table level, let's show you, we'll describe, or let's just show tables, and then describe it. So let's show tables. And from a tables perspective, we would assign privileges using the tables underscore priv table. This particular table, by the way, applies to any of the tables that are defined anywhere within our system. And we'll show you what we mean later on. This is not by any means specific, the tables underscore priv table to the MySQL database. This particular tables underscore priv table applies to any database defined throughout this instance of MySQL. So that's something to keep in mind. And ditto for the columns underscore priv table. Now before moving on to columns underscore priv, let's describe tables underscore priv to see what columns are included. Columns include the host, the name of the database. That's very important because as we've mentioned, the tables underscore priv table stores permissions for any table, for any database, for any host that our DBMS system has access to. Usually it's all local and tied to the system that the DBMS runs on, but with clustering, it could end up being another host somewhere else on your network. So it's the designed in such a flexible way to include identifiers or columns to represent the host, since in a clustered environment, the host could be, again, someone on another node somewhere else in the network. There's a user column, specify any user, the name of the table, the grantor who's granted access, the timestamp, and so on. So you get the picture. Via tables priv, MySQL can control access to any table throughout the DBMS system. Let's describe columns priv using describe columns 
underscore priv. And similarly, you see the commonly recur recurring fields or columns of host, DB, user. These are recurring columns. Table name, so which table name can we expect to find the column in? The DB is important because you may have a given column that you're interested in securing in a different DB, and it may actually be on a different host. So the relationships that are maintained here helps MySQL to secure access to the proper column in this case, since we are examining the columns underscore priv table. So here are the key fields that control access. And notice their types. For the most part, they're character fields. But in some cases, you have booleans or enumerated fields, such as yes, no's. Super. And notice this one's the column priv is set to be select, insert, update, or references, which means it needs to be one of those values. So let's show tables again to get a sense for the key grants tables before we move on to using the grant command. The three key tables include DB, host, as well as user. These are the three key tables that MySQL consult. But additionally, if column or table per permissions are defined or process level permissions are defined, such as the ability to run a create statement or an alter statement or a grant statement or any of the many process type functions that are permitted by MySQL, they'd be defined in the prox underscore priv table. So again, control access to tables using tables underscore priv, control access to columns using columns underscore priv. Now you don't need to use the MySQL terminal monitor to maintain the relationships in tables priv as well as columns priv. You can use front end tools to make it much easier. There are graphical tools as well as web based tools such as PHP MyAdmin which makes it much easier but it just helps to understand what's happening under the hood, how the relationships are laid out. We've yet to actually describe procs underscore priv. Let's use a describe to see the columns that are defined and again the same recurring field names host db and user but notice this time you see routine name what is the routine name well the routine name can be one of many many routines which we'll be discussing we won't discuss all of them we'll tell you where to find them and they're actually in the mysql reference manual and all over the web but routines include for example create alter and grant these are routines so the routine level, which we haven't, haven't discussed, let's first put column scope level, which we m m manipulate using the mysql.columnsPriv table. And as far as table scope level is concerned, we manipulate using the mysql.tables underscore priv table. And then for routines, routine scope level, and these are all the scopes that are permitted within MySQL, at least as far as the current version, up to the current version. For routines, we interact with MySQL dot. Notice we're specifying purposely the database name first, followed by the table name. So we interact with MySQL dot prox, and we thought we had it in memory here. We did block it. We thought prox underscore priv or prox underscore priv table. And within prox underscore priv, we define different routines such as create, alter, and the like. So the column name that you see here for routine name is the field or column which stores the routine that the user is granted access to. And of course, the routine that the user is granted access to may or may not be restricted to a given host, a given DB, and of course to a given user. The user's ID is always stored, but MySQL needs to know which host and importantly which, which DB. It's usually the local host that's under management, but it really needs to know which DB the user is permitted to, let's say, run a create statement. Now again, if we grant access such as create or any of the routines on a global basis, we use the MySQL.user table and then the lower scope level tables are ignored because throughout the DBMS the user will be able to let's say run create alter grant etc but in a secure environment you're going to want to define routines on a per DB basis and maybe even more granularly than DB table level or column level so 
the prox underscore priv table is very straightforward. It defines the host, the DB, and the user so that we have this tuple taken care of, followed by the routine name, the routine type, whether it's a function or a procedure. There are many functions, such as the set password function, and there are many procedures, some of which are built in and others we can define stored procedures, the grantor who actually granted the permission, and so on. So let's copy the create all to grant routines into our scope level section as an example. So we'll just specify using i.e create all to grant as common routines, but there are many, many more routines, many of which we'll cover. So to recap, MySQL is a typical DBMS. It arranges objects in a hierarchical fashion, which means at the top of the hierarchy is the DBMS system, in this case MySQL. MySQL manages databases. Databases include, for example, the default MySQL and tests, and databases contain one or more tables, and then tables contain one or more columns. Routines can be assigned to any level in the hierarchy, including databases, tables, and columns. We have various scopes where we can apply permissions. The global scope, the database scope, the table scope, the column scope, and the routine scope. If we assign permissions on a global basis, we simply assign the permissions directly to the user's accounts. When we've defined a user, such as Linux CBT, for example, we simple, simply give them all access to their user account, and globally, throughout the DBMS, MySQL sim can simply consult the MySQL.user table for resolving whether or not the user, Linux CBT, is permitted to do anything throughout the DBMS. So, for example, let's select user comma comma host comma password from mysql dot user and see what's returned notice we created a user Linux CBT in fact we want in addition this is the username root at Linux CBT these are the only users that are defined we have a root so this is the proper qu query we have a user root who's allowed to log in from Linux CBT Media 1 as well as Linux CBT Media 1 dot Linux CBT dot internal with a given password. If we were to select the privileges additionally, so for example, let's describe MySQL dot user and we can rerun the query for example to see what global privileges the user root at Linux CBT Media 1 is granted. We can individually select the privileges described here, or we could just execute the show grants command, which will show what privileges the user has. So let's rerun the query we just ran. We know that we have these users. Let's then execute a show grants. Show grants by default shows the privileges for the currently logged in user, but we're not interested in root at localhost, the user who we're currently logged in as. We want to see privileges for root at 192.168.1.100. So show grants for root at 192.168.1.100. This shows privileges for that particular user. And root at 192.168.1.100 has been granted all privileges on all databases and all tables, which inherently means all columns. That's one thing we neglect to mention. The table scope level supersedes or overrides the column scope level. Let's explain that again. If you've defined table scope level permissions, it applies to all of the columns, since a table is nothing more than one or more columns. However, you could further define a permission on a column level basis and have that column level basis permission override the table level. So let's return to our terminal monitor, and all privileges have been granted to the user who we've queried using the show grants command for root at 192.168.1.100 identified by a certain password. But this user doesn't have the grant option which the user root at localhost has. So the remote user is allowed to log into our system, but they're not allowed to grant privileges to other users, which effectively means they can't create additional users on the system and grant privileges to them. Super.
Additionally, if you wanted to select individual privileges from the mysql.user table or individual global privileges, we could return only the columns that we're interested in. So if you wanted to know, for example, whether or not root at 192.168.1.100 has the create privilege, for example, simply run a query and include the create priv. But the show grants cuts to the chase. But we run the query and in addition, let's ignore password, but then also take create priv, and you'll see that the user at 192.168.1.100 has the create priv on a global basis, which means the user can create objects. They can't grant permissions, but they can create new objects in the database. Here are other permissions. Whether or not the user should use SSL or to if they're granted a create routine or if they can run indexes or alter privileges. Let's look at alter for example because alter is a way to change the definition of a given object such as a table or a column. Let's in addition to create let's comma and output alter and you'll see that all of these users pretty much super users also have the alter privilege. But again show grants shows this information much more concisely. But this again is all on a global basis. If you see that a user has such wide privileges or super level privileges on a global basis, then there's really no need to analyze on a more granular or lower in the hierarchy basis such as at the DB level, table level, column level, or routine level for a given user. Because you know the user pretty much has full rights if within the user table, mysql.user table, they've been granted privileges that are permitted in the MySQL DBMS. So next, we're going to do some exercises using the grant command. We'll set up some users and see the effects of assigning permissions both locally and remotely.